Hi friends, and welcome to Art Lab. I'm your host, Kendall Hilligus. So I have been a working full-time artist for about a decade now. And looking back, there were so many moments in those first few years where I had just this you know, fledgling, fragile version of my creative practice. I'd invested all of this time in painting and drawing and learning those specific technical skills. And I had finally also discovered a practice that I really loved spending time in. And uh, for the first time, I felt like I was on my path. I had no idea where the path was going and I couldn't see very far ahead. I had to mostly just kind of look down at my feet to make sure I could find the next step. It felt a little bit like following a breadcrumb trail in the woods, but I was doing it. I was actually making work regularly and loving the process. But amidst all of that good stuff, the the thing that would still trip me up was when every once in a while I would kind of look up and I'd realize, wow, I'm actually at a fork in the road. I have to decide which way to go. I can't just, you know, keep focusing, keep my head down and focus on the next step, the next step, the next step. I actually have to make a decision here. And in those moments, I remember just feeling totally lost and overwhelmed and longing for somebody to just kind of hand me a map, a a trail guide, or better yet, for, for someone to become my trail guide to actually take my hand and walk with me to show me the exact right steps to take, which way I should choose left or right. And making creative work is overall just one big exercise in decision making. What to paint or write about, which materials to use, what style to approach your work in. So the creative work itself is full of navigation and choice making. But then there are also those crucial points that you come to on your trail, kind of like I was just describing, where you have to just decide not only what are you going to do in the work itself? What are you going to do in the individual piece? But where are you going to go with it overall in in a more global sense? Where are you going to take your work? Making those smaller decisions like whether to use warm or cool colors in your shadow or what type of media you want to use that day can, of course, be challenging. That's the day in, day out of traveling a trail, which can be bumpy and unpredictable as so many non-paved roads are. But then those fork in the road moments where you have to truly decide whether you should focus on one thing or another, editorial or children's book, performance or writing, fine art or commercial, can be challenging in their own way at a whole other level. Because in those moments, you're making a decision that impacts your practice for much longer than just the individual piece that you're working on that day. You're not just deciding where to step, you're actually deciding where to turn. You're picking one trail over another. And while you may be able to come back around and travel, Travel that other path at another point in the future, in this moment, you have to choose one or the other. You have to decide what you're going to focus on right now, which trail you're going to take, which trail you're going to spend your time on for the next little stretch of time for the foreseeable future. And in that place, the natural knee-jerk reaction for so many of us is to look for something external to support our decision. And honestly, it makes sense that this is something that we want, that external validation. Because when it comes to vocation, to the work we do, the things that we devote our time to, we live in a world of paved roads and tracks. If you want to be a nurse, there is a track. If you want to be an engineer, there is a track. If you want to be a teacher, there is a track. You get your bachelor's degree, maybe your master's degree too. You complete your teacher certification and any licensing requirements. You find a job opening, which you can reasonably expect will exist for you when you are ready for one, and you apply. In so many jobs and vocations, the tracks are already laid out like this. There are tons of examples of the steps to follow and lots of people who have traveled the track before you. All you have to do is just hop on and follow it to the destination. And if you get on a track and you keep going, you can be pretty sure that you will arrive where you plan to arrive in some reasonable period of time. But in the arts, in creative vocations, there are just not that many tracks. Sure, there are in-house or agency jobs, uh, professorships. These career tracks do exist. There are a few uh, tracks in the creative world after a fashion. But for the most part, creative vocations, whether they're personal or professional, are a lot more like trails than tracks. They're not standardized. They're not paved. There's no one-size-fits-most approach. Some parts of the trail might be smooth. Some might be rough. There can be unexpected twists and switchbacks. They can have breathtaking views, but 
but they can also be really isolated and treacherous and remote. And to make matters even more challenging, you can't really even follow anybody else's trail either. Even if you can learn a great deal from others and from their experiences, finding their way on their own trail, you will ultimately have to find your own. Even though this is something that's talked about pretty regularly, the fact that you you know have to make your own way as a creator, and we all kind of know this, I think because we live in a world of tracks, we still want to find the track for creative vocation too. So many of the questions I hear from other artists who are early on in their practices are aimed at track finding. Even if they know that no track exists, they're still asking very tracky questions. They want to know the route in advance. They want to be sure that if they head in a particular direction, it will get them where they want to go. They want to know how long it will take and what they can expect along the way, and even more importantly, what they can expect when they get there. And these are perfectly valid and understandable questions. I do not mean at all to disparage anybody who asks these or to imply that they're you know, just looking for a shortcut or that they're not willing to work. In fact, I am sure that I have asked my fair share of track finding questions as well, because it's just so natural to look for a track when that is what everyone else is doing, when everyone else seems to know their destination to know when their train is going to arrive at the station and to be able to plan their lives around that arrival, of course, we want the same thing. But in creative work, the route you take is much less prescribed and it requires a really different kind of skill to find and follow it. It requires you to pay attention to the landscape, to try things out and fail, to use your own navigation skills, to find the next step and to follow it, whether you know the destination or not. So today we are gonna talk about how to do that. We're going to dig into the skills and practices that will enable you to stop looking for a ready-made track and instead find and follow your own trail. Let's go. All right, we're going to go over four trail finding skills today. And the first skill is neutral observation. Neutral observation is a kind of stepping outside of yourself, panning out to see the full picture of you and your decisions and the environment that they're all happening in. We've talked about this before back in episode two when we experimented a bit with the practice of diffusion. Diffusion is a tool from ACT, A-C-T, that helps create a kind of separation between you and your feelings and emotions. So if your emotions are kind of like a TV show, being on the show, being a character on the show is like being totally fused with your feelings and emotions. You are your feelings and your feelings are you. Whereas watching the TV show is a little bit more like observing your feelings. You still experience them. You don't magically become immune to that, but you do have a little bit of distance, a little bit of separation from those feelings. And because of that, you can be more neutral in observing them. This skill extends not just to your thoughts and feelings, but to observing the choice choices that you're making day in and day out and their outcomes, looking at what you want to do and what is actually happening and then noticing the gap between those two things. This is really helpful because at a baseline level, it just helps you to calm down. It helps you to regulate yourself when you're in those stressful moments. If you feel like you're literally in the TV show and it turns out to be a scary or anxious or uncomfortable show, it can feel like reality and it can feel like you're trapped there. Like it will always be that way. And having the ability to detach from those thoughts and feelings to create that separation can make it a lot easier to regulate. And then once you're regulated, to be able to make your creative decisions from a place of calm and clarity. So how to practice the skill of neutral observation. There are several ways to do this. Obviously, continuing on in that practice of diffusion can really help. So uh, this is something that we go over really in depth in episode two, so I'm not going to get into it too much here. But if you want a refresher, go ahead and listen back to that. You can also visit Dr. Russ Harris's website. Um, I've mentioned him before. I mentioned him in episode two. He's a great resource. His website is a great resource for this practice and for other practices that are related to ACT. So those are some things that you can check out if you want to learn more about that, if you want to dive a little bit more into the practice of diffusion. But Another related tool that you can experiment with here that will help you to kind of grow those neutral observer muscles is to examine and catalog your internalized myths. So the stories that your brain likes to tell over and over again, these could be things like I'm not good enough or I never finish anything or I have no style or voice. Basically, any of those thoughts and feelings that can come up again and again that are kind of instantly upsetting and destabilizing to you. They tend to vary from person to person, but they can have a lot of common themes, especially for creative people. Essentially, if your anxious brain had kind of a greatest hits tape, what would be on that tape? 
The point here is just to take an inventory of those thoughts, to take an inventory of those greatest hits, not to argue with them, not to come up with a plan to debate them, to, to all the counterpoints, all the perfect counterpoints, but just to notice and identify those repeat themes, the greatest hits that your brain likes to play over and over again, your, that your brain likes to kind of binge on when it's in a place of anxiety. And this will help you recognize and diffuse from those thoughts a lot more quickly in moments when you're feeling really overwhelmed. A similar exercise that you can try here is to catalog your blind spots. So another cataloging exercise. We all have these. They're just kind of like particular shortcuts that we use to interpret the world, particular patterns of behavior that we fall into without uh, necessarily thinking about them. For example, are you someone who tends to favor action over reflection or vice versa? Do you need to balance things out by putting more focus on being strategic and considered? Or on the other hand, are you an overthinker who tends to get stuck in the processing phase? Uh, usually these patterns will show up in multiple areas areas of your life, not just in your creativity. And I know for me, one of my biggest blind spots is all or nothing thinking. And it often shows up in my creative practice as a desire to make the biggest, most ideal version of whatever idea I'm focused on at the time. If I want to make a thing, I want to make the thing. I want to make it in the biggest, most intense, most magical way possible. The smaller, kind of more approachable ideas just never feel quite as interesting to me in the moment. I'm constantly having to remind myself to accept and embrace the smaller version. Version. The other exercises here are more aimed at observing your internal world, your thoughts and feelings and mental shortcuts, but this one is aimed more at observing what's going on in your outer life, your actions, your choices, and how those actions and choices interact with your environment, how you're spending your time day to day, what you are already doing or not doing in your creative practice, as well as all of the things that are truly external that you really don't have the power to change, governments, health, uh, maybe financial responsibilities and family obligations to a certain extent. Reflect honestly on what is really actually within your power to change here and try to take a catalog of that along with those other things, along with the catalog of your you know, greatest hits and um, your kind of natural brain ruts that you have a tendency to, to fall into. So neutral observation as a skill can impact lots of areas of your creative practice and learning to do it effectively, both in moments of quiet, calm reflection and in times when you are at a really rough spot on the trail where there are probably going to be some intense feelings and you need to make a quick decision is really crucial. I like to think about it kind of like both sides of healthcare. You have, you know, like the preventative healthcare where you're taking care of your body, you're moving, getting enough sleep, drinking enough water, hopefully eating some fruits and veggies. That's like the intentional practice and reflection that you do in the non-urgent moments to become more aware and in tune with your internal landscape and those external realities. And then on the other hand, the more kind of in the moment situations where you're maybe spiraling internally or getting caught on an unhelpful brain channel, having a really tough time making a decision on your creative trail, those are more like triage medicine, being able to quickly assess what is happening and what needs to be done next. Practicing neutral observation in both of those situations will expand your skill and make you a lot more effective at trail finding. The next skill, skill number two, is curiosity or openness. So if neutral observation, our, our first skill, lets us kind of assess trail conditions, pan out, get a bird's eye view of the path, and consider the all the factors that we need to hold in tension as we navigate, curiosity is more like our compass. It's a little bit more contained. It's more specific. It helps you navigate in a more concrete way, always kind of pointing you towards your true north. Thinking back earlier to that more common paradigm that I mentioned, this tendency to want to find a track in your vocation, in the work that you do, um, because that's what so much of the world around us is doing. Um, if, you're, if you're approaching the decision-making from if you're approaching your vocational decision making from that track finding perspective, through that track finding lens, if you're you know making your decisions based primarily on what will get you to a specific destination by a prescribed time, there isn't necessarily a lot of curiosity involved in that process. Of course, you may be a super curious person who has chosen to go into a vocation that has a track. I'm not saying that curiosity and tracks can never go together. Of course, they do. But if you have a vocation that does come along with a prescribed track, your curiosity is probably getting funneled more towards the actual work itself. There's not as much curiosity involved in the finding of the track, in the navigating, the figuring out what the next step is on the track, because it's kind of already all laid out for you. And even if you go 
off on a detour or you maybe take a little bit of a non-traditional route. If you're in one of those tracky fields, one of those vocations that has a track, you probably will just still have to go back and finish that prescribed track at some point. I'm thinking here of vocations in you know medicine or science where there is obviously lots of curiosity and creativity in the work itself, but the actual navigation of the vocation, how to make your way into that work has a lot more of a prescribed track. But when you're doing creative work, on the other hand, curiosity is crucial, not just for the work itself, but for actually figuring out what comes next on that vocational path, which steps to take on your trail. And I don't just mean for people who are doing it professionally, I mean for people who are doing it with any sort of intention and seriousness. So to practice listening to your curiosity, developing and following that curiosity compass, you can try another cataloging exercise here, similar to the greatest hits exercise that we did in the last section, where you took stock of the anxious thoughts that your brain tends to repeat in those moments of stress. This time we're going to look instead for compelling repeat themes that you tend to gravitate towards. So what are the stories and questions that you keep coming back to, the things that you could talk about over and over, the moments that, you know, pretty predictably will make you feel that expansive sense of wonder and awe. Essentially, what are your curiosity greatest hits? If it's tough to bring all of them to mind right away, if you haven't done a lot of this reflection before, just start paying attention to the things that feel fun and interesting and that put you in a playful headspace and that you want to spend more time in. Write those things down whenever they come to mind, and then you can look back later and try to find the patterns among them. It may seem unlikely initially that they could be related at all, but it almost certainly there will be some sort of pattern. There will be some sort of consistency. And seeing that there is that pattern, seeing that there is that consistency in the things that spark interest for you or that make you feel curious and open-hearted can make it a lot easier to trust those things. For me, I know that I have a very consistent interest in things that feel melancholy, things that are beautiful and transcendent, but also fleeting and ephemeral. And just like noticing the pattern in those negative greatest hits can make it a lot easier to see them for what they are and to not be so swayed by them in the moment when you're having intense feelings, noticing the way curiosity repeats and comes back to the same things and the same kinds of things over and over, the way it points to those things over and over can make it easier to trust it and to recognize it for what it is, which is a compass giving you useful information about the next step in your trail. And of course, the most obvious way to practice the skill of curiosity is to actually do it, to to notice something that you feel curious about, something that you want to explore and investigate and experiment with and to follow it. But if that feels a little bit too scary, if that feels too big and intimidating, especially initially if you're just getting going, if you can't figure out what that would even mean or what that would really look like to follow your curiosity compass, start by just noticing the direction that your curiosity seems to point or one of the directions that it seems to point. Then try to come up with the smallest, easiest, most accessible step in that direction. You don't necessarily have to commit to traveling the full length of that trail. You can just step one foot onto it and then peek around the corner and see what's there. This is what we're always talking about, making you know the smaller version, the smaller and easier version of your idea. Doing this, just taking a little peek around the corner of that trail will let you test the accuracy of your compass. And in testing it and doing that over and over, following your curiosity and testing that over and over, you will get better at recognizing and listening to that voice. Our third pathfinding skill is humility. You may be saying here, oh, I've got this one. I already know my work is terrible. I know I don't have anything to offer, but that is actually not at all what I'm getting at here with the word humility. And I think there's even probably a case to be made that when we feel that way, when we have those intense thoughts of self-loathing around our creativity, that's actually a kind of defensiveness against potentially feeling exposed or ashamed when you inevitably discover that your work is terrible, just like you always feared it was. And in that way, it's not really humility. It's actually kind of more of a shield for our dignity. In her book, Big Magic, Elizabeth Gilbert has this quote that I love, be careful of your dignity. It is rarely your friend. So I'm really thinking of humility here as the antidote to dignity, as a kind of openness or willingness to let go of your dignity. It's not negative self-image or feeling like a failure or thinking you're a loser with nothing to offer. It's more like a kind of openness, an openness to the idea that you might look or feel silly in your creative work, openness to the idea that you will make mistakes in your creative work, openness to the possibility that something that seems frightening or pointless or dumb might actually have creative value in the long run. So 
while it is tricky to imagine being able to actively work this muscle, I think we can get at it by kind of working the muscles around it, by desensitizing our dignity. One way to experiment with this would be to say yes to something that you would normally scoff at. So what are the things that bring up that internal voice that says, oof, that's cringe, or I would never do that? For me, when I was first getting started, this looked like moving away from the things that my dignity wanted me to paint, which was, you know, people, portraits, epic paintings about really big themes and toward the subjects my curiosity and openness wanted me to paint food and random objects from around the house and those are things that I definitely would have turned my nose up previously now this was a big shift but it took months and months of daily painting where I was gradually kind of loosening my grip on that dignity work first I gave up the idea of painting really large but I was still clinging to portraiture and the need for symbolic depth in my work and then I gave up on realism trying to force myself to be more loose and expressive, not particularly because I enjoyed it, but because if my work couldn't be explicitly about deep feelings, then I could show the depth of my feeling in my expressive brushwork. And it took me several months of very regular painting of going in this kind of right direction, but not fully committing to it over and over again, still having this posture of grasping at my dignity the whole time before I got to a place where it was finally desensitized enough, where I was finally desensitized enough to try painting purely from a place of curiosity and openness. So can you think of what your version of this is? What is your curiosity interested in and your dignity threatened by? Try doing a small version of one of those things and see what happens. Another very concrete practice here would be to share work that's not perfect. We've talked about this in previous episodes too, how sharing work is intimately connected to the process of making it. And this is one of the really specific benefits of that practice. Sharing work that is imperfect or incomplete is a great way to desensitize your dignity. And to really practice this myself, I am going to share some of those awkward portraits I was painting back when I was still clinging to my dignity. They will be in my Instagram stories today. And if you want to be brave and show me some of your dignity guarding work, I would love to see that too. Okay, so we are on to our fourth and final practice here, experimentation. Viewing your creative process like a kind of lab where you can test different hypotheses or to use our original metaphor here where you can test different trails with the expectation that many of the things that you try, many of the things that you test will fail and that even some of the things that will ultimately be successful in the end will have many failures embedded within them along the way. This practice really connects with everything that we have already talked about today, connects with humility because to have a posture of experimentation you must be willing to admit that you don't have all the answers, that you're not sure what is going to work, and that you're willing to try unusual things and test out new trails. It also ties in really tightly with curiosity, our second skill, because you can't really experiment if you're not curious about anything, if you're not asking questions, if you're not wondering what direction to go in or feeling that sense of wonder and awe, you can't test anything. You can't experiment with anything. And if you're running experiments, you of course need that sense of curiosity and hindsight too, because you need to be able to look back and say, why did this happen? What worked or didn't work here? And then of course, circling all the way back to our initial skill, neutral observation, experimentation ties in there as well, because to run an effective experiment, you have to be good at observing the data of that experiment. So experimentation is kind of like the overall posture that ties all all of these trail finding skills together. So how to practice. The first thing you have to do here to, to practice experimentation is to figure out what you can experiment with, what you can test. So you have to come up with a hypothesis, with something to prove or disprove. And I think one of my favorite tools here is the PET, the process enjoyment test, which we talked about back in episode three. And there will be a link in the notes if you want a little refresher on that. But the basic idea is that a PET, a process enjoyment test, is a structure of self-imposed constraints that allow you to measure and evaluate different aspects of your creative process. And while our focus back in episode three was on testing for a process that you enjoy, that's why it was called 
called a process enjoyment test, you can also use this basic structure to experiment with all sorts of things and things that are more concrete and outcome driven too. It doesn't just have to be about process enjoyment. The key ingredients are intention. So knowing what you're testing at the outset so that you know what to pay attention to, what to look for and what to measure and then structure. So you know when it's time to end the experiment and time to pivot to that evaluation mode. For example, if a fork in your creative trail is whether to focus on performing original songs or performing in musicals, decide to build your experiment around one of those for a set period of time and lay out all the factors that are important to you, all the things that you'll be measuring in that experiment. So these will be different for everybody, but they'll likely be things like whether you enjoy it, how easy it is for you, whether you can stick with it, whether it's having any traction professionally, whether it's fulfilling you personally, whether the results and the outcomes are having you know, the kind of impact that you want in the world. Really, any of these factors or any infinite number of others can work. It's really about you and what you value most and what you want to experiment with and get out of your creative practice. So put even more simply, having a posture of experimentation means trying a specific idea, looking honestly at the actual results, and then using what you learn to make your next decision on your creative trail, and then doing that process over and over and over again. A couple things to keep in mind here. Overall, the more factors you try to evaluate in a given experiment, the more challenging it may be to discern the results. So rather than trying to set up an experiment that tests for everything all at once, for the enjoyment of the process and potential economic or commercial success and personal impact and fulfillment, maybe just pick one primary focus initially, not saying that you can't work those other things in too, but pick one thing that you're mainly paying attention to initially. The next thing to keep in mind here is uh, if you are somebody who tends toward being an overanalyzer or, you know, doing tons of planning, and if you have along with that, a tendency towards procrastination and your procrastination involves just doing endless prep work and research and getting all the right supplies, kind of like we were talking about in uh, our last episode on perfectionism, you should still take time to structure things a bit so that you know the experiment you're running. You, you still need to have structure in your experiment. And if you find yourself getting into a pattern where you know you're, you're pretty much ready to start, but then you start to think, oh, actually, you know, let me just double check this. Or maybe if I just switch up this one last aspect of it, it will be a lot better in the long run. If you notice that you're getting to that place, if planning is taking a huge part of the process, if it's eating up all your creative time and you're not ever actually able to get to the experiment itself, that is your clue to make the experiment smaller. Take down the complexity, have a bias towards action, even if it feels messy or insignificant. And then if the reverse is true, if you tend to be somebody who is just all action all the time and is just diving into things left and right without thinking too much and maybe ending up down lots of unproductive rabbit trails because your bias is naturally towards action and less towards reflection, then try to take the opposite posture. It's always this cycle between action and reflection. And I think most of us at different times of life, uh, in different seasons of life, can have a tendency towards one or the other. So as you're focusing on finding your trail by experimentation, have an awareness too of whether you have that tendency towards action or reflection, and then try to balance it out by kind of forcing yourself to look through the opposite lens pretty frequently. For me, I tend to be much more on the reflection side, which is probably not going to be a huge surprise, um, more on the kind of thinking and endlessly planning and trying to come up with a perfect concept. And if I'm unreflective about it, I will just naturally spend tons of time in that place, either in ideation or analysis. So either looking ahead and imagining all of the epic possibilities and trying to figure out how to do them or looking back and figuring out all of the problems with the things I've already made. It's really hard for me to get out of that place and into action. So that is where I tend to put a lot of my focus and energy on just forcing myself to get into action, whether I feel like it or not. But if you're the opposite, if you have more of a tendency towards action without reflection, then try balancing it out the other way. Try adding in more reflection. And all of these exercises that we, we've talked about today are going to be perfect for that. They're, they have, they're, they're mostly reflective exercises. So before we wrap up today, I want to share that this episode you are listening to right now is actually the final one for season one of Art Lab. It has definitely been short. It's just been eight episodes, kind of a little mini season. But overall, I am just really happy with how this process has gone. I'm really grateful. It feels almost kind of poetic to be ending this season on this topic that we have just been uh, delving into today because this whole process, this whole process of making Art Lab has been one big trail finding experiment. <laughs> 
And while there are still plenty of things about the show that I want to work on and improve and figure out, I'm truly just having so much fun making it. And to put that into the episode metaphor, it's feeling like this, like Art Lab is the right trail to be on right now is, uh, and I've, you know, probably got as a creative person, I, I almost always have multiple trails open, but Art Lab is definitely one that I want to stick with and stay on and keep experimenting with. And because of that, I am planning on diving pretty much right into production on season two right away, right after our, I finish up season one. Even so, there will definitely still be a lag in when the new episodes are released, but hopefully season two will drop sometime later in the summer. And I'll be aiming for a longer season two with more episodes, but still on these same kinds of topics. We'll be spending time in the same place that we have been in for all of season one, that place where creativity and feelings overlap. So between now in late summer. If you have any ideas or questions or topics that you think fit into that space, things that you would like to get into or to cover in season two, please do let me know. You can leave a comment if you are uh, watching or listening on YouTube, or you can always email me, DM me on Instagram, whatever. It's pretty easy to find me. However you do it, I would love to hear your thoughts and what you would like to get into next in season two of Art Lab. And of course, all of the thank yous. So thank you to everyone who has left reviews on the show. Thank you to everyone who has shared the show show. To each of you who has shared your work with me on social, I am so grateful and appreciative of that. Thank you to my patrons for sticking with me through all of this experimentation all the way from YouTube to, to this. A thank you to Fabiola Lara and Andy Miller for all of the support and encouragement and getting Art Lab off the ground, especially in those early days. And to Wave Podcasting for editing and publishing the show. And thank you most especially to you, you with the headphones, you listening right now. Uh, thank you you for spending your time with me not just today but throughout this first season and I cannot wait to reconnect with you in season two bye you.